Deborah Sampson, or you may know me as Robert Shirtliff. I served a year and a half during the revolution, and I am the only woman to get an honorable discharge from the army in the recent war. I'm currently writing this petition to the Massachusetts State Legislature asking for my pension, which they refused me because I'm a woman. We are more in need of it now than ever, but you'll be wanting to know more about me, so I shall start at the beginning of my story. I was born in Plimpton, Massachusetts Bay Colony on December 17, 1760. My parents, Jonathan Sampson and Deborah Bradford, were descended from passengers on the Mayflower. In fact, my mother was the great-granddaughter of William Bradford, second governor of the Plymouth Colony. I had seven siblings. The oldest, Robert, died when he was eight, which was before I was born. Then came Jonathan, Elijah, Hannah, Ephraim, me, Nehemiah, and little Sylvia. We were a farming family on overworked land. We all had to help out, but when we were finished, we could play. I loved running around with my siblings, but I treasured most of all my time with Grandmother Bathsheba. Bathsheba Labroche was French and loved telling me stories about women fighters. She told me about Joan of Arc and that she had named my mother after a woman fighter in the Bible. However, when I was just five years old, my grandmother passed away, leaving me devastated. Soon after, my father left to seek his fortune in England. Mother received a letter saying that he had drowned at sea, yet some believe he ran off to Maine, took another wife, and started over. Once father disappeared, we fell into poverty, and as mother was sick and couldn't take care of us or work on the farm, she sent us older children to live with various family members. She took Nehemiah and Sylvia with her when she took up a job working in another family's kitchen. As I was born to be unfortunate, my son soon clotted. But I was sent to live with Cousin Fuller. Ruth Fuller was an older woman who never had any children of her own. She was very good to me. She took care of me and taught me to read, but after three happy years with her, she got very sick and passed away. By the time I was eight, I had lost my grandmother, my father, and now Cousin Fuller as well. After she passed away, I was sent to live with Mrs. Thatcher. Mrs. Thatcher was an 80-year-old widow, and instead of her taking care of me, I took care of her, though I was only eight. She was sick, and thankfully soon went to live with relatives, and I was once again without a home. I was then indentured to the Thomases. Mr. and Mrs. Benjamin Thomas and their ten sons lived on a farm in Middleborough, Massachusetts, and there I stayed as an indentured servant for ten years. I was to help Mrs. Thomas with the cooking, cleaning, sewing, and weaving, but I also had to take care of the younger children, chop wood, and work on the farm. In return, I had good food to eat, clothing to wear, and a warm house to live in. Mr. Thomas was deacon of the church and was strongly against educating girls. However, I had a ravenous hunger for knowledge, and instead of letting the deacon's naysaying stop me, I begged his sons to teach me all they'd learned at school each day. In secret, I learned lots. They taught me whittling as well as hunting and shooting. I got very good at shooting and could hit most anything I wanted to. Through those difficult 13 years, I grew strong and tall. Taller, in fact, than Mr. Thomas's oldest son. <clears throat> While the average height for a woman in that day was about 5 foot, I stood 5 foot 8 inches. When I turned 18, my indenture was finally over. Mr. Thomas helped me get a job as a school teacher, which was a very, very odd idea to him, as it would have been more proper for me to marry, in his opinion. Mind, I have never been averse to the idea of love or marriage, but I was only 18, had just finished being an indentured servant for 10 years, and I wasn't ready to give up my freedom. No, I wanted to see more of the world. So there I was, a teacher in the summers, boarding with the Thomases, and in the winters I boarded with various families, spinning and weaving their wool for them. Their older sons went to join the Continental Army, and watching them go, I longed to be able to fight for my country too. But it was not a woman's place. Must I forever counteract inclination and stay within the compass of the smoke of my own chimney? After two years, I started living with the Leonards. I spun and wove their wool for eight pence a day in my board. While I was there, I stayed in their son, Samuel's old room, for he had, of course, enlisted. In a chest in his room, I found a set of boys' clothes that looked just right to fit me. I tried them on one evening, and to my surprise, I looked like a boy. Maybe my wish to join up could come true after all, I thought. So one day, I got dressed in the clothes and went to Israel Wood's house, where there was a recruitment officer. I told him my name was Timothy Thayer, I was 16, and wanted to enlist. Everything was going fine until I signed my name. Mrs. Wood recognized the odd way I hold my quill and, of course, commented on it. So quickly, I took my bounty money and left. 
By the time I was supposed to muster, word had gotten out that someone dressed in Samuel Leonard's clothes and holding their quill just like me had joined up. I panicked and didn't show up for muster. Anger was running high, and soon many were looking for the Timothy Thayer who had taken bounty money and not shown up. Along with that, everyone that knew me was furious that I'd been so scandalous as to wear men's clothing, and the Baptist church cast me out. I gave the bounty money to a trusted friend with the instructions to return it for, my, for me, and that night I fled dressed in clothing that I had been making. I didn't let this incident stop me. Instead, I walked almost a hundred miles to Uxbridge, Massachusetts to try again. Mind, the distance was only about forty miles as the crow flies, but I'm not a crow, and I traveled in a very roundabout manner, working at farms as a hired hand along the way. However, if I was unable to find a hospitable family, I camped in the woods. As I traveled, I thought about the stories that I'd heard of the grievous consequences that had befallen other women who dressed in uniform and pretended to be soldiers. These poor women suffered consequences ranging from dishonorable discharge to execution by hanging. Once I arrived in Uxbridge, I went to the recruitment office to sign up. I signed on for three years because, although it was spring of 1782 and the Battle of Yorktown had already happened, there was still much fighting. This time, I took the name of my late older brother, Robert Shirtliffe. I was incredibly scared that I would be recognized. However, I had no trouble signing up and received the bounty money that was given to all new recruits as encouragement to enlist. I still had to say I was 16, even though I was actually 22, because I, of course, had no beard. I was placed in the Light Infantry Company of the 4th Massachusetts State Regiment. We were chosen for a superior size and skill with a gun. Life in the army was more difficult for me than for the boys, not because of the work. I was used to that after ten years of working on a farm. But along with this, I had to conceal my real identity as a woman, which is incredibly hard, especially while living in such close quarters. We slept four soldiers to a tent, gamed together, ate together, drilled together. Well, you get the idea. There was really no way to get away from the others. There was a vast range in our ages, the youngest being 16, and no real upper age limit, as long as you could shoot a gun, and often even if you couldn't, you were accepted. Though I was one of the best shots, I was made fun of because of my obvious lack of facial hair. In their opinion, I was the baby-faced boy. The first real battle came all too soon. My regiment had been sent to scout near Tarrytown, New York. Suddenly, a group of British soldiers appeared out of nowhere and opened fire. We fought back, reloading as fast as we could. Smoke filled the air, and there were screams of death. Suddenly, I felt a jarring impact as something hit my leg. My first thought was that someone was throwing big rocks, but when I felt another such blow, I glanced down. I saw, to my horror, a rapidly growing patch of red on my white breeches. I looked up, and before I could think, I saw the redcoats charging towards us, sabers and bayonets flashing ominously in the afternoon light. In a moment, we were engaged in fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat. There were screams of pain and triumph, agony and hate, and there I was, a farm girl from Massachusetts, illegally posing as a man. I knew right then and there that I hated war and all the deaths surrounding me. No pen can describe my feeling experienced in the commencement of an engagement, the sole purpose of which is to open the sluices of human blood. I turned to my right just in time for a misjudged sword blow to just barely hit me. The force of the impact made me stagger backwards and the warm red blood gushed down my forehead. As my vision blurred, I saw the look of triumph on my attacker's face turn to the look of shock as a bayonet sliced through his neck. Dizzy, I stumbled and fell as I dodged another attack. Eyes half closed and disoriented, I arose, grabbing my gun from where I had landed. Soon we were pushing the redcoats back. Once they retreated, I slumped against a tree, gasping for breath, panicking because I knew that if the surgeons operated on my leg, I would be found out for sure. Some of my fellow soldiers were helping all the wounded get to a hospital and came over to me. I begged for them to leave me, but they refused to abandon me. So I was taken against my will to the hospital. Let's go. Look Hi. at that. You're bleeding up. Let's go. Come on. That's all. Right. Later, the doctor came over to me and started treating my head wound. I had to think fast because I knew that if I was discovered, the highest punishment was death. The doctor finished wrapping my head and asked if I had any other injuries. I told him that no, I didn't. 
but when I saw him looking at my bloody pants leg, I quickly told him that it was just a minor laceration and that it would be fine with time. He told me to stay put and that he would come back later to look for any other injuries. As soon as he was out of sight, I grabbed my hat and fled. I took refuge in an old barn, got my soldier's knife, and set to work on the first bullet. I tried to dig it out, but to no avail. It was in too deep. After realizing that, I wrapped the wound in a piece of ripped-off shirt tail. Now that the adrenaline was wearing off, I felt the searing pain pulsing through my leg with every heartbeat. Knowing that bullets are better out than in, I gritted my teeth and started on the second one, which seemed closer to the surface. The bullet hole was bleeding less now, as the bullet was blocking most of it. I took my knife and started digging it out. The pressure behind the bullet was such that it came out much more easily than I thought it would. Gasping in relief and pain, I wrapped it with another piece of bloody shirt tail and promptly blacked out. Soon after I regained consciousness, I joined back up with my regiment. However, my wounds never fully healed, even to this day, and when Roger Snow fell sick, I volunteered to stay behind with him. We stopped at a farmer's house in neutral territory and requested lodging. Of course, the men agreed but our lodgings turned out to be his hot, stuffy attic. Roger Snow's condition continued to worsen, and we had little to no food. Through the floorboards, I could hear a rowdy party every evening, and soon realized we were staying in a loyalist's house, and the parties were with a notorious group of Tories called the Cowboys. After ten horrible days, Snow died. I escaped and told my superiors about the Tories. They put me in charge of a group of twenty men, and we went and surrounded the house. After we were sure the Tories were very, very drunk, we fired very many loud shots into the air. They stumbled out, startled and confused, and we were easily able to capture them all without shedding any blood. Eventually, I was made an aide-de-camp of the general, and in 1783, we were sent to Philadelphia to quell an uprising of angry patriot soldiers. However, there was a terrible fever sweeping through the city and the military camps. I got it, but refused to be taken to the doctor. Eventually, I fell unconscious and was taken anyway. I was so ill that when one of Dr. Binney's assistants checked for my pulse, he couldn't find it. I was pronounced dead, but before they were able to take me away, I made a sound. Dr. Binney came over to examine me better, and while checking for my heartbeat, he discovered that I was, in fact, a girl. Instead of turning me in right away, he took me to his house and treated me. Once I had gotten better again, he wrote a letter to General Patterson and asked me to deliver it. I did so with much dread because I knew that it contained the truth about me. Once the general read and reread the letter, he looked up and asked if I was indeed a woman. I told him that, yes, I was. His reaction was nothing like the death sentence I'd been expecting. He bade me go change into some of his wife's clothing. I did so, and when I came down again, he asked my commanding officer to come in. He then asked the officer if he knew me. Mystified, the officer said that no, he'd never met me in his life. Soon enough, the general told all. My commanding officer was just as shocked as I thought he would be. In October of 1783, I received an honorable discharge from the army after a year and a half of service. In the spring of 1885, I married Benjamin Gannett, a farmer from Sharon, Massachusetts. I have a son named Earl and two daughters, Mary and Patience. Our farm never provided enough, and we were soon impoverished. We are at last caught up to the beginning of this story. I never received my pension, and am writing this petition to the Massachusetts State Legislature in the hope of receiving it. There. All finished. For Lily. This petition was successful and she received £34 plus interest back to her discharge. However, her family was still very poor and as her leg never fully healed, in 1809 she sent a petition, this time to Congress, asking to receive an invalid soldier's pension. This was refused. Her friend Paul Revere also wrote to Congress saying that humanity and justice obliges me to say that every person with whom I have conversed about her, and it is not a few, speak of her as a woman of handsome talents, good morals, a dutiful wife and an affectionate parent. I have no doubt your humanity will do, 
will prompt you to do all in your power to get us some relief. I think a case much more deserving than hundreds to whom Congress has been generous. Her petition was resent in 1816. This time it was approved. She was awarded $76.80 a year. With this, she was able to repay all of her loans and improve their farm. In the spring of 1827, she caught yellow fever and died on April 29th. She was buried in Sharon, Massachusetts. She will always be remembered as the woman who fought against both redcoats and gender roles, and was the only woman to receive an honourable discharge from the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War.